Good morning, everyone. We'll just uh, we'll allow a few minutes for others to join. Uh, if you want to give us a couple of minutes, and we'll be back shortly. OK, I think we'll make a start. We've got uh, a good group who have joined us online now. Good morning. My name is Craig Bearsley, and I lead ACOM's energy business in Australia and New Zealand. I'd like to welcome you all today to this ACOM webinar, Making Offshore Wind a Reality, a local and global perspective. Offshore wind will undoubtedly play a major role in our energy transition. Just how smoothly we transition is yet to be determined, but what is clear is that we must learn and adapt as the industry progresses. Apply global learnings, innovations, new technologies and approaches to ensure the efficiency and sustainability of offshore wind development here in Australia and New Zealand. But before we begin, I'd like to first acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia. We pay respects to elders, both past and present, to emerging community leaders. We recognise and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters. Welcome also to those joining from New Zealand today. Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Kato. I have a few housekeeping notes to run through before we get started. Firstly, please note that this webinar is provided as general information purposes only and does not constitute legal or professional advice. The webinar is also being recorded today and we will be making the link available to all of you in a follow up email to share with your colleagues and networks. All attendees will also receive a certificate of attendance. This will be distributed to you electronically although you're more than welcome to print a copy to stick on your fridge, as is customary at my house. In terms of the format today, we have two presentations, followed by uh, a section of time we have allowed at the end for speakers to respond to your questions. These questions you'll need to submit via the Q&A function in Teams. You should all have a Q&A icon up the top of your screens. Please feel free to enter your questions into that Q&A function at any time during the session. These questions we will collate in the background um, to, to share with the presenters at the end of the session. Your questions won't be visible to others on the call, nor will we be identifying the submitters. So there's really no reason to be shy. You can actually ask us anything. In today's session, we're going to explore emerging global trends challenges and learnings from industry best practices. We will also discuss some of the challenges we face locally, an evolving regulatory framework and rapidly developing industry. I'm thrilled to have two of the people helping to make offshore wind a reality here with us today to help. David Hyatt, our Industry Director for Environment based in Melbourne, who is going to speak to some of the local regulatory challenges and strategies to navigate these. David is a leading environmental practitioner with over 20 years of experience managing environmental issues for businesses and governments and is skilled in project options analysis, environmental risk assessment, approval strategy development and environmental impact statement preparation. David's experience includes approvals for major marine projects that traverse multiple jurisdictions. This includes leading ACOM's work on the approvals for Australia's most progressed offshore wind farm development the Star of the South project off the southeast coast of Victoria. Our second speaker today is Dawn McDonald, ACOM's global offshore wind market sector leader. Dawn is based in Toronto, Canada, and is going to help us explore some of the emerging global trends and learnings we can bring to our own projects from more progressed offshore wind markets overseas. Dawn has extensive experience in offshore wind origination, development, financing, construction and operations, having worked on projects in the UK, France and Germany. Notably, she was involved in developing the first commercial offshore wind projects in France from early development through to construction and commissioning. In her current role, Dawn leads our global efforts in offshore wind, working closely with our regional teams to collect our capability with our clients and support project delivery. To kick things off today, I'd like to pass the mic to David, who is going to share some of his on the ground experience working on the planning and development of the first offshore wind farms in Australia. Welcome, David. 
Hello everyone and thanks for joining us. The offshore wind industry is just starting out in Australia and New Zealand, but the signs are that it's about to take off. Feasibility licence applications have closed for the Gippsland region and offshore wind declarations have been made for Newcastle and Portland, with the Commonwealth foreshadowing other areas in the near future. New Zealand's a couple of years behind Australia, but they have started to move as well. I want to share with you some learnings from three years working on the permitting of an offshore wind project in the Gippsland region. In particular, we worked closely with regulators and had the chance to test various approaches with them along the way. It's been quite a journey. The three topics I'll cover in my presentation are coordinated assessment process, project design envelope, and cumulative impact assessment. My first learning relates to the overall approvals process. The regulatory landscape in Australia is relatively complex with respect to planning and environmental approval for offshore wind developments. This is because the project components straddle Commonwealth and state jurisdictions and the requirements of Commonwealth and state governments are different but overlapping. I might also mention at this stage that each state in Australia has different rules around planning and environmental assessment. This figure shows the situation for Victoria. The wind turbines themselves for Australian projects will always be in Commonwealth waters, which start at three nautical miles from the coast. These parts of offshore wind projects are clearly within Commonwealth jurisdiction, but to complicate things, the Commonwealth also has an interest in a discrete set of matters within state waters, so within the three nautical miles, and on land, areas of state jurisdiction. In the case of Victoria, a number of specific approvals are required for various components and they differ depending on where you are. It's typical for projects to prepare an approval strategy to map out these requirements and the pathway to secure their approvals. So how do we tackle this? Since we know the Commonwealth and the states want to have a say on how offshore wind projects are developed and will want to maintain their statutory powers to make decisions. Notwithstanding that the state processes and the Commonwealth processes are strictly separate, we recommend adopting a coordinated approvals approach. There are a number of benefits of this approach. Firstly, and probably most importantly, bringing the Commonwealth and the state process together will minimise confusion for stakeholders, especially communities. And it's worth remembering that one of the key aims of an approvals process is to make it accessible to communities and to facilitate participation. We think a coordinated process has benefit, benefits for regulators too. It helps with the demarcation of Commonwealth and state interests, and we believe it also provides clarity for developers. So what does a coordinated assessment process look like? There are a number of practical things that can be done to enable it. We recommend that these are agreed with the Commonwealth and the state regulators at the start of the assessment. Establishing a combined terms of reference for the EES is beneficial. This ensures that all the requirements, Commonwealth and state, are consolidated in one place. Development of a combined terms of reference necessitates interactions between jurisdictions, which itself helps to clarify expectations and iron out how, how overlapping interests will be addressed. In Victoria, major projects interact with a technical reference group. Now, this is a group of regulators that oversees the impact assessment process. By including the Commonwealth regulators in this group, a more integrated engagement is possible. The Commonwealth and state regulators can hear from each other in this forum and potential for diverging positions is minimised. And holding joint regulator workshops on key topics is also beneficial. We recommend combined EIS documentation as well. This minimises duplication and potential contradictions that could happen if separate sets of documentation are prepared and done at a different time. Joint exhibition of approvals documentation is also desirable. Doing this is convenient for stakeholders and the public, who in the end aren't really interested in the requirements of different levels of government. What they're really interested in is understanding what the project is about, 
and the potential implications for the environment and their communities. My second learning relates to the application of the project design envelope in impact assessments. This assessment approach has its origins in the UK, so European developers will generally be familiar with it. It's an approach whereby developers, when defining their projects for assessment, don't specify a final fixed design, but rather they specify a range of values for key design parameters. This is what we call the project design envelope. For example, a project might identify a range of turbine sizes. To deliver the required capacity, the project could have different combinations of turbine size and turbine number. The project design envelope is also relevant to other aspects, foundation types, export cable routes, substations, grid connections, and even construction methods. There are two main reasons why this approach is prudent and useful for offshore wind. Firstly, the, it future proofs a wind farm approval against technology developments, something that's happening radically or rapidly in the offshore wind industry. Secondly, it retains flexibility and competitive tension for future procurement decisions. In principle, support has been received from the Australian regulators for the use of the project design envelope. Although a note of caution, it's not okay to build in unrealistic feasibility. If the envelope is too big, it may not work. There is a balance to be struck between looking after the buildability and flexibility for the developer and providing sufficient certainty for the regulators and the community. There has to be sufficient clarity about what is being proposed for the approvals to be secured. To explore this a bit further, in this slide you'll see some typical ranges that could be specified for the key wind turbine parameters. In this example, we need a smaller number of big turbines to deliver the same wind farm capacity as a greater number of small turbines. For our impact assessment, our next job is to identify the maximum design scenario. The maximum design scenario is a combination of parameter values that is likely to cause the greatest impact. This is the scenario that's used as the basis for the impact assessment. For the issue of bird strike, this is the total swept area of the turbine blades, taking into account the turbine rotor diameter for individual turbines and the number of turbines that you have. We run the assessment based on the maximum design scenario, and if the impacts of this situation are acceptable, then the impacts of every other combination of parameters will also be acceptable. The flowchart on this slide shows how the project design envelope is used in practice. Firstly, project design envelope is defined by upper and lower parameter values. The assessment is made on the maximum design scenario, and these scenarios will be different depending on the assessment topic. The significance of potential impacts are evaluated against assessment criteria. If the impact is assessed to be significant, then the project envelope may need refinement, typically by narrowing the bookends, bringing them in, usually at one end. This is an, an iterative approach with regulators. Although used um, somewhat in onshore wind, this method is relatively new for regulators in Australia. The confidence has been built by explaining the reasons why this approach is favoured and examples from the Northern Hemisphere have helped to convince regulators of its suitability. So I expect to see it adopted generally in future offshore wind assessments in Australia and New Zealand. My final learning relates to assessment of cumulative impacts. The potential for cumulative impacts is front of mind for regulators and the community. This is because there's been quite a number of project announcements made by developers and because the areas declared by the Commonwealth are quite extensive. This has left communities to wonder how many projects will be put into each area. 
The level of concern, I think, also reflects the general sensitivity around coastal environments, which are highly valued in the Australian context. There's limited guidance in Australia on the assessment of cumulative impacts, although we do know that the Commonwealth are working on some uh, guidelines right now. In the absence of local guidelines, we developed a method for assessing cumulative impacts, and it's based on the obscurely named Advice Note 17 from the UK Planning, Planning Inspectorate. This is an example where rather than reinvent the wheel, we can benefit from global experience and translate and adapt proven techniques for Australia and New Zealand. The assessment method is summarised in this flowchart. We start by identifying projects nearby that we shall consider. This includes projects recently approved but not constructed, and all, also those that are newly proposed. We then ask whether those projects are within the zone of influence for our project. This is the test as to whether the impacts have potential to overlap and add up to something bigger. The zone of influence differs from topic to topic. For example, it's much larger for visual impact than it is for noise impacts. Once we've identified the qualifying projects, we do some more analysis to work out how to approach the cumulative impact assessment. We check for whether the projects are overlapping in time and whether they're above a materiality threshold. One of the most telling features of the method is it looks into the question of data quality. It recognises that cumulative impact assessments can only be comprehensive when good information is available on the projects of others. Now this is often difficult when projects are in the early stages of development and assessments are yet to be done by those proponents. Our method provides a way to assign each project an assessment tier which dictates the approach to the assessment itself. On this slide, I have a statement from the UK Planning Inspectorate. They say that the assessment should be undertaken to an appropriate level of detail commensurate with the information available at the time of the assessment. The assessment will move from more qualitative to a more quantitative assessment as the availability and certainty of information increases. Our three-tiered three approach responds to this guidance. Tier one projects, well, they're the ones where we've got good information we can rely on to assess the additive effect of two or more projects, and it might be quantitative in those cases. Tier two projects are where information is not so good, but still a qualitative cumulative assessment can be undertaken. Tier three projects are really where we're more in the space of um, speculating about impacts and attempts to undertake cumulative impact assessment for these projects might actually be misleading. This method has in principle support of the Commonwealth and Victorian regulators, and it puts projects in the position to present information on this topic in their impact assessment documentation, something that they will all be required to do. And this in turn will help communities to understand the potential for cum cumulative impacts with other projects. Well, that brings me to the end of my presentation. And to sum up, I'd like to leave you with three key takeaways for offshore wind planning in Australia and New Zealand. Number one, work hard at the beginning to establish a coordinated assessment process that has the Commonwealth and the state regulators on the same page. Number two, build the project design envelope into your assessment process to provide flexibility and future proof approvals. And number three, have a structured procedure for cumulative impact assessment that takes into account the quality of data on the projects of others. Thank you for listening and I'll hand back to Craig. Thanks, David. It's great to get an appreciation of the additional complexity that comes with planning and consenting of these offshore projects and some of the strategies that 
you and the industry as a whole is employing to address the inevitable uncertainties that come with the developing sector. I particularly enjoyed hearing about the design envelope approach to approvals. I've personally seen a number of projects onshore in Australia where development conditions can be unnecessarily restrictive or outdated, um, which can impact their feasibility and often limits opportunities for true innovation or adoption of latest technologies. So that's really great to see. We've had a couple of questions come through while you're speaking, although not, not a huge number, I have to say. So I think everyone's keyboards are still warming up. We've got more than more than 80 people on the call. I've got two questions that have come through. I might just throw one to you now, David, because um, I'm sure there'll be other questions coming through before the end. This question came in, says, how is visual impact from offshore wind assessed? And is there anything that can be done to mitigate the visual impact? It's a really good question. Um, it, there's no doubt that visual impact is a key impact assessment topic and something that will um, have lots of attention for each new development that comes along. Large turbines, and they're getting taller and taller, um, are potentially visible for up to 25 kilometres um, on a clear day from the coast of Gippsland. So um, you can see why there is attention on it. The Commonwealth have decided that turbines must be a minimum of 10 kilometres uh, from the shore. So to some degree that um, mitigates the extreme impacts of um, the visual uh, impact. Now, um, turbines can't be shielded. So the best things uh, developers can do to manage and mitigate visual impacts are really to uh, do it at their site uh, identification stage. So by choosing a site that is um, sufficient distance from some of those key sensitivities like national parks or uh, Ramsar wetlands or uh, key coastal towns will be a key measure that uh, developers use to uh, reduce the impact of, of visual. But um, the way it's done is that in each case, uh, the developers will develop uh, visualizations. They will make them public and stakeholder engagement is really important here to share um, the visualizations of the um, wind farms and to get feedback from those communities um, during the approvals process. Great, thanks, David. I'll, I'll hold, there's been a couple of other questions come through as well while you've been speaking, but I'll hold on to those to the end session. Everyone, please feel free to keep um, sending your questions through for David uh, through the Q&A function. Um, but for now, I'll pass the mic on to Dawn, who's going to take us through the second half of today's session, where we're going to explore some of the emerging global industry trends and delivery challenges that we will have to grapple with here in Australia and New Zealand as our industry develops. Over to you, Dawn. Thanks, Craig, and uh, thanks, David, for that fantastic overview of uh, offshore wind regulatory processes in an Australian context. Uh, I was really lucky to have actually been in Australia just a couple of weeks ago and to be able to meet with David and the rest of his team, as well as some of our fantastic uh, energy team in uh, Sydney. So um, glad to be able to reconnect today. I've been asked to provide a short overview of some key topics from the global offshore wind market, as well as to contextualize some of the key challenges for offshore wind relative to onshore wind and other sectors that might be more familiar to the audience. Globally, offshore wind is a substantial and rapidly growing sector. Uh, there's over 60 gigawatts that are cur that's currently installed and another 30 gigawatts in late stage development. But if we look at the portfolio of pipelines in um, pipeline of projects in early development, it's over 270 gigawatts. Today, I'll discuss some of the key issues and trends as that market grows, including uh, the challenges with the increasing size of equipment and projects, uh, the challenges of securing local consents, uh, how we ensure timely and cost effective connections to grid infrastructure, managing uh, an increasingly tight global supply chain, the push for greater consideration of the full impacts of these projects and, and finally the availability of resources to staff these technically complex mega projects. 
Dramatic in, uh, reductions in offshore wind LCOE over the past decades have fueled, uh, have been fueled by an increase in turbine size and an average project capacity. There's been a spectacular rate of development for turbines with the key suppliers locked into a virtual arms race for who can bring the next step change in turbine to, this, to the market. The overall capacity of these projects has similarly increased from a standard of 200 to 400 megawatts up to a new normal of gigawatt scales, fueled by the continuous hunt for economies of scale. These larger and more numerous turbine uh, requirements have led to a need for to scale up vessels and cranes, foundations, port facilities, leading to scarcity as OEMs need to retool their factories and installers upsize their fleets. Increased pressure on supply chains is further exacerbated by increased demand for local manufacturing as we go into new jurisdictions and inflationary pressures. The net result of all this upsizing has been a need for massive injections of capital, not only for developers uh, who are faced with increasing need for development spend and expanded capital budgets, but also for the entire supply chain as ports, facilities and uh, vessel fleets are expanded. It leads to the question, are, are we reaching the peak or can we continue this level of, of acceleration in size? The scale of offshore wind is shifting the balance for utility power systems by injecting significant amount of powers into increasingly restricted grids. In many cases, this is welcome, as the arrival of offshore wind projects coincides with the planned decommissioning of existing power plants, many of them carbon fueled. In many cases, this offers national and regional grids the opportunity to rapidly green their grids, coordinating, but coordinating the timing of these changing power injections can be very complex and requires substantial capital investments for grid operators. As project scales change and developers start looking further offshore, the choice between HVAC and HVDC is increasingly becoming uh, relevant. HVDC offers significant electrical efficiencies to developers and operators, particularly over large long distances, but the increased global infrastructure buildouts around the world have resulted in significant pressure on the HVDC supply chain. For many developers, the right electrical design may end up being the one that they can actually procure in time. Interconnection design challenges are not purely electrical in nature. With the proliferation of offshore wind, developments uh, in government specified at government identified zones, the race is on to secure interconnection. Given the likely stakeholder concerns about impacts to private lands and public spaces, a coordinated approach might best serve the industry to avoid stakeholder fatigue and outright opposition to what could be perceived as a never ending survey and construction campaigns as multiple projects work to bring their power onto the grid. A broader industry approach to design, routing, particularly through congested areas and sensitive environments and export system construction may be helpful to meet regional deployment goals. The question is how best to achieve that. Looking around the world, we can see examples of solutions proposed by other jurisdictions from independent offshore transmission operators to private shared transmission systems that have been proposed by groups of developers. The Australian and New Zealand context and market is unique and input from developers, grid operators and stakeholders will be required to come up with a solution that enables the achievement of the offshore wind deployment goals. Australia and New Zealand are lucky to have ecosystems and cultures which are unique in the world. And the offshore wind sector will need to be creative and open to local inputs to adapt the best practices from the broader offshore wind market to the specific needs of the local environment. As the offshore wind industry has developed, several topics have been have arisen as hot button issues for stakeholders. And we can assume that these issues will be top of mind for stakeholders in, in this region as well. Visual impact due to the installation of turbines near coastlines, particularly near national parks and tourist areas, is frequently a sensitive topic. 
early and ongoing engagement with stakeholders to understand particularly sensitive viewpoints and the nature of the concerns to determine if there may be any opportunities to, for solutions to address stakeholder concerns and requirements is very helpful. Commercial, recreational and traditional fisheries have uh, frequently had significant concerns with respect to offshore wind developments. There are undoubtedly real impacts to these groups, uh, particularly during the construction phase, but solutions from other jurisdictions, including compensation schemes, careful siting and operational guidelines may help to provide some context to develop a made in Australia or a made in New Zealand approach to ensure that relevant fisheries stakeholder concerns are addressed. Assessments to impacts to local species, including birds and marine mammals, will require specific knowledge of the local ecosystem to forecast the potential impact. However, mitigation measures from the global market, including noise mitigation concepts and bird avoidance strategies, may provide some guidance to developers. However, these implementation of these methods may need to be adjusted to understand based on the requirements of the local ecosystem. Perhaps most important in the Australian and New Zealand context is the appropriate engagement of first people and consideration of their inputs in project development plans. In addition to respecting traditional knowledge um, associated with the uh, environment and species, developers will need to consider the impacts of proposed offshore wind developments on traditional lands below the sea and the potential historical sites that may be found within project boundaries. Australia and New Zealand's unique ecological and cultural environments presents a new challenge to offshore wind developers. Lessons from other offshore wind jurisdictions may provide a framework for addressing concerns. However, local engagement will be key in, to ensure that the projects gain the social license required to construct and operate. Balancing the urgency of our energy transition requirements with the need to address stakeholder concerns will be a key issue for governments, developers and local communities. Australia and New Zealand's geography presents specific challenges to the offshore wind market as developers uh, source materials, equipment and vessels to construct their projects. The supply chain for the offshore wind market has been built around the original European market with manufacturing, fabrication facilities and installation vessels based largely in Western Europe. While OEMs and suppliers may be willing to support Australian and New Zealand projects, many of them have significant order books based on growth in their local European markets and likely have limited available capacity to support projects abroad. Several of these European suppliers are investing in Asian facilities and vessels. However, given the growth in Asian markets, these may also quickly be oversubscribed. The recent growth of the Chinese market may offer a potential alternative supply option to Australian and New Zealand projects. Historically, these suppliers have focused on their domestic market. However, as um, their market slows down and the broader supply chain market develops, some capacity may become available to projects in the broader regions. Developers will need to balance their need for equipment and vessels with pressure from local communities and governments to demonstrate the economic benefits uh, to their region. Finding opportunities for local investment may be challenging. However, an inventory of existing suppliers and skill sets could help highlight potential prospects in the domestic market and potentially for export into the broader region. Ports are critical to the development of the offshore wind sector. The capacity for relevant construction ports will develop, determine the ability of the overall market to achieve the offshore wind deployment goals. Appropriate regional planning and development funding for ports facilities would support the efficient use of these critical assets. The supply chain challenges facing the Australian and New Zealand offshore wind markets are significant and there's a need for creativity and strategic thinking to ensure that that these market demands um, uh, are met and that these regions capture the opportunities that come from this new sector. As the offshore wind market has matured, the focus has turned from the early technical and commercial challenges of a developing sector to the broader environmental and ethical considerations of a mature market. It's not enough in the eyes of many stakeholders for offshore wind projects to be better than equivalent carbon-based projects. Projects need to demonstrate that they provide a net benefit to society and environments on their own merits. 
There's been an increasing focus in recent years on the full life cycle carbon footprint of projects in development, including the consideration of embodied carbon in the materials and equipment selected for construction, the operational impacts throughout the life of the project, and the ultimate decommissioning and reuse recycling of project materials. All this requires significant focus in the early stages of development to ensure the carbon impact of development, design, construction and operations activities is integrated into decision making. The focus of developers is also shifting with some encouragement from governments, regulators and in some cases their own shareholders from a goal of minimizing impacts on the local ecosystem to a target of leveraging installed offshore wind infrastructure to provide a measurable benefit to environments. There's some meaningful work being done on projects around the world, focusing on leveraging the relatively protected environment created by offshore wind assets to reestablish oyster beds, for instance, in Europe, and to provide habitat for net biodiversity gains. It's really exciting to think of the creative solutions that could be developed as Australia and New Zealand's unique marine ecosystem is now integrated into an offshore wind context. Local communities are also demanding a meaningful say in the projects impact their region and developers are being pressured to demonstrate long term benefits to impacted communities. The relative value of potential project benefits will vary by community. Many may be focused on direct economic benefits and jobs, but others might be more interested in support for local initiatives or adjacent industries. Meaningful engagement with local communities and First Peoples is critical to ensure that a specific community's needs are get are addressed. Perhaps one of the greatest challenges that uh, the offshore wind market faces is the limited number of skilled resources with experience in the offshore wind market. Governments, renewable energy and specific offshore wind deployment targets around the world are driving a significant growth in the market, both in the original birthplace of offshore wind in Northern Europe, as well as in emerging markets around Europe, North America, South America and Asia. This is driving a global competition for a very limited pool of resources through all elements of the supply chain. However, the solution is not simply to entice offshore wind uh, experienced workers to Australia and New Zealand projects. There's a real need to build the local talent pool to ensure that regional sensitivities and market factors are appropriately considered in projects and to ensure the long term sustainability of the market. Knowledge of industry best practices and lessons learned is critical. However, it'll need to be paired with on the ground knowledge from individuals and teams who understand how to build energy infrastructure in the region. The offshore wind market is not alone in its growth ambitions. Governments and businesses around the world are making significant investments in infrastructure to meet the needs of the energy transition, which means that the offshore wind market is competing with other growth areas for talented trades, scientists, engineers and professionals. So what's the solution? It seems in order to meet our market growth targets, we need to look at new strategies to execute our projects. Looking to digital solutions, for instance, through the development of the project could enable um, a efficient use of limited resources by streamlining processes, focusing on value added tasks and facilitating global collaboration. The challenges facing the offshore wind market in Australia and New Zealand are significant, but collaboration between developers, grid operators and regulators may offer unique op opportunities uh, to create solutions that meet the growing market's needs. The offshore wind sector is well established and there are many lessons learned that can be adopted from the European experience, which can help accelerate development in Australia and New Zealand. But this knowledge will need to be balanced with the regional understanding of markets, cultures and environments. There's increasing social acceptance of the need for action to address our climate emergency. However, stakeholders are balancing this urgency against a strong desire for demonstrable benefits to local ecosystems and communities. And finally, the growth in the offshore wind market, along with other major infrastructure 
sectors is putting significant pressure on labor markets as all parts of the supply chain push for talents and skills. This pressure op opens a new opportunity for creativity and new, more efficient ways of working, and digital tools may ultimately be developed to fill the gap. These are really exciting times for the emerging Australian and hopefully soon New Zealand offshore wind sectors. I'm really looking forward to watching the market develop over the next coming years. Thanks, Dawn. That was a fantastic summary of the current state of the market and, and, some, and some of the challenges we're going to need to face and overcome. Uh, there's a lot covered there. I'd actually love to drill down on some of those areas in future sessions. So hopefully we can get you lined up again in a couple of months time. One, one of the themes that I found really interesting was that of coordination and collaboration and that it came through really clearly in both yours and David's presentations, whether that be coordination of state and federal approvals, collaboration, early engagement with stakeholders or in the development of shared assets such as grid connection or port infrastructure. It seems clear to me at least that the projects most likely to succeed will not be the ones going it alone. If I could ask, you know, from your international experience, are there any regions or examples where you've seen this collaborative approach to development done well? So one one particular example comes to mind. Um, uh, in my home country, um, Canada has a is looking to launch its own offshore wind sector, and a number of developers of um, offshore wind projects as well as some hydrogen projects have um, banded together to propose. Um, a subsea power line that could connect uh, eastern Canada down to the U.S. East Coast where there is higher power demand centers. It's not yet known how exactly that structure would be uh, implemented, what the commercial um, structures would be, but it's an example of the development community as a whole understanding that there's something that can be done that can help facilitate moving a project forward and banding together to try and get the ball moving on um, a key piece of infrastructure. I, I can see something similar working here in, in Australia. Certainly we've seen that on land with the concept of the renewable energy zones and a number of offshore uh, zones identified as well. The other area in your presentation that really grabbed my attention, Dawn, was the issue of human resources constraints. It's something I think many on the call are probably very aware of as it's an issue facing the entire energy sector in Australia and New Zealand already. And it's certainly something that, that concerns me um, as ACOM is one of those resources that, that we need to be supporting the industry with. Um, however, I do take, I think, some comfort in the fact that issues with resource and supply chain constraints uh, are neither new nor insurmountable. Mm -hmm. uh, if we give the example here in Australia of the resources boom in the early 2000s, which peaked with almost 300,000 people directly employed in the resources sector and many, many more in supporting industries. Um, that industry is, is still over 250,000 directly employed. Um, by comparison, the renewable energy industry in, in Australia is currently just 30,000 people. Um, but we are heading in the right direction as that's more than double what it was five years ago. But you can certainly see a, a, a time in the not too distant future where the renewable energy industry is significantly larger than that of the resources industry. But how we get there will be quite a challenge and to rapidly build that base um, that we need to support the energy transition is going to require you know, multiple strategies that, that you discussed on. But if there's one thing I think we, we, we learned from the resources sector, is that attractive salaries go a long way to help bring talent across from under other industries. Um, and that was a big part of the rapid growth of resources in that sector. However, we, we may not have the same flexibility in the power sector um, as political and public support for renewable energy is often predicated with the assumption that it will not result in higher power prices. Um, so our growth may well be constrained as we try and maintain that sort of delicate balance it is that a similar um is that a similar situation you're seeing globally where 
where, where there's a view that uh, renewable energy um, must be affordable. I think. Oh. Yeah, I, I, I believe I've seen similar um, reactions in many parts of the world. I, I do believe certain jurisdictions, um, European nations have um, by and large been um, accepting of some need for whether it's government support or power prices um, to, to push along the industry at the, the early days. However, um, given the recent inflationary pressures, I think we're, we're seeing a bit of a pushback all over the world. Um, in many cases as well, we may there may be a bit of a delayed reaction um, due to the timing between when some of these early decisions are made and when people actually see the impact on their power bills. Thanks, John. Um, I might throw now to some of the questions that have come in while the presentations have been running. There's actually a related one that came in um, just before dawn that says, vessels and, log and logistics are going to be a huge bottleneck. Can a collaborative approach work here? Is this approach used elsewhere around the globe with competitors? If not, how do we see this playing out? It's a really interesting question. Um, and I would point everyone to um, the figures that I mentioned at the beginning with respect to how this industry has grown. So 60 gigawatts currently um, in operations, that, that took us 30 years. Um, another 20 gigawatts, 30 gigawatts in construction, and then 270 in the pipeline going forward. So it's a mass, mass shift in growth globally all over the world. So a lot of the um, while sharing of vessels, to my recollection, I've not seen that happening in the industry in the past, um, but the increased growth all around the world is going to necessitate some clever solutions. And that might well be something that could work um, fantastically in an Australian context. Fantastic. We've actually, while I've got you on the mic, Dawn, I've got another related question that's come in. It says, what training and education have you seen or is available globally that can upskill people? So in terms of university trainings, um, so there's a number of universities in um, Europe, uh, Copenhagen, in Amsterdam, um, that have uh, specific university programs for um, offshore wind capabilities. There's safety programs in place. Um, again, many of these uh, uh, private safety colleges that can teach all the relevant um, safety skills for uh, more the individuals working at sea, the operations workers working at height, all those various elements. Those are typically privately um, available. Um, but by and large, from the individuals that I um, worked with in, in the past, most have come from either uh, a renewable energy onshore and have learned on the job, or they've come from an offshore oil and gas background and again, picked up the, the deltas in between. Um, so I, I think there needs to be a combination of, of bringing in some of that knowledge and that skill set. Um, from people who've been there and understand the complexities of these projects. That's certainly really, really important. But I do think there's a lot of knowledge in adjacent industries that can also be applied into the offshore wind market um, quite readily uh, with adequate supports. Fantastic. Thanks, Dawn. Um, and certainly with your help, we're looking to roll out similar training and development within within ACOM um, for our people who are looking to make that transition from other other areas, whether it be onshore renewables development or other adjacent sectors to work in the offshore industry. I might throw now to, to David to tackle some of the questions that, that came through on, on your earlier presentation around planning. Um, first one I've got here is, uh, are there offsets payable to the Commonwealth for the offshore wind turbines, do you have to buy the seabed real estate from the Commonwealth? Um, I'm not a, an expert in the licensing of the seabed under the 
um, offshore electricity infrastructure act. So um, most people are, are probably aware that there's a, a process whereby uh, feasibility license uh, need to be um, obtained to um, get the permission to develop in a certain area. And once that successfully goes ahead, um, th then there's a, a, a regime of commercial licenses that will be undertaken with the Commonwealth. And that's the main mechanism whereby the Commonwealth will uh, deal with individual developers in terms of their uh, requirements to operate an offshore wind farm. Fantastic. See, I knew the BSP curly ones, David, so that's how everyone online can tell that we're not um, we're not planting questions. We don't necessarily know the answers to all of them, but we'll have a we'll have a have a go. Uh, next question relates to First Nations custodians. David, what role do you think First Nations custodians will play in offshore wind developments in Australia and New Zealand? Um, First Peoples' involvement in offshore wind development is very important and uh, there's probably three main aspects. It, traditionally, impact assessment has looked at artefacts and archaeology and what um, what is out there that might be affected by a project, how can it be um, protected or salvaged? Uh, so that's one part, but um, we're now seeing um, also an emphasis on intangible values. So uh, understanding what those other uh, cultural values are, um, working with the First Peoples is really important, whether it be landforms or particular species that are part of stories that um, the First Peoples have that make them uh, highly valued in, in a particular region. And the third one, and I think um, Dawn mentioned it earlier in her presentation, submerged heritage. So that's really an area that's getting lots more focus. Um, and most people are probably aware that Tasmania was once joined to Victoria 6,000 years ago. You could walk across between the, um, what's currently the mainland and Tasmania. So there was occupancy of that area um, uh, 6,000 years ago. And so we need to look into what are the, the Aboriginal cultural health values in that area. The, the last thing I would say is that um, the First Peoples groups, um, in my experience, are looking forward to developing deep partnerships with developers, um, not being transactional, because they can um, not only want to contribute uh, to the development, but also how else can they become involved in offshore wind projects in their uh, delivery as well. Fantastic. Thanks, David. I hadn't actually considered the fact that um, the Gibson area was was once above uh, above the sea, uh, but that's a, a really good insight. A another question relates to obtaining approvals. It, it is what timeframes should be anticipated for obtaining approvals, Commonwealth and state? I think a starting point here is the um, baseline monitoring that's required. Um, it will differ um, region to region, but I think a solid starting point is the expectation of two years of um, baseline data covering things like birds and marine mammals and, and other key aspects. Um, so you more or less, uh, there's, there's two years, and then by the time you've finished that um, monitoring program, there's the assessments that need to be done, the um, uh, preparation of technical reports and the EIS documentation. So. I would say that it's realistic that it'd be another 12 or 18 months beyond the two years of monitoring. So that adds up to what, three, three and a half years. It would be a realistic time frame, um, but it can be longer, of course, depending on how you approach it. And, and one of the key things is to um, have a reasonably firm um, project concept that doesn't evolve and change um, because if you do evolve and change your project, then you often have to go back and, and reassess. So, um, but to answer the question, I'd say three to three and a half years is a realistic time frame. Thanks. I, I might throw that also to, to Dawn from the international perspective, having seen projects that have gone from that early um, origination stage through to actually being um, developed and commissioned. What, what's a typical time frame are we seeing for projects in, in North America or in Europe? Well, we'd have to look primarily at um, at uh, Europe for projects that have actually been fully constructed. Um, within the US context, we have some projects that have now been permitted, but the very first projects are just being constructed as we speak. Um, 
historically rule of thumb used to be 10, 10 years from the time that you first um, acquired your seabed through to actually um, having spinning turbines. Over the past number of years, there's been increasing pressure to try and find opportunities to accelerate that. And that pressure is not just on the developers, but also on governments and regulators to try and find ways to streamline permitting regimes so that we focus on what's truly critical in approvals and less on bureaucratic elements. Fantastic. Thanks, Dawn. We've, we've got a, only a couple of minutes left, so I might just Get, throw one last question to you, Dawn. During your recent visit to Australia, what was your impression of the readiness of the industry here for offshore wind? What gaps do you see in the Australian market or areas where investment is needed now? So I was very, very lucky in my um, recent visit to be able to meet with our teams as well as um, clients in both uh, Melbourne and Sydney. Um, I, I was quite impressed how far um, we have advanced and I, I think actually what um, the thing that possibly impressed me the most was the overall uh, attitude that uh, we might not have all the solutions figured out. We might not have sorted out all the details of the process. However, we're aligned on the end goal and we're not willing to stop our progress in order to find that perfect solution. We are acknowledging and accepting that certain elements um, are going to have to be sorted out in, in probably short order, but we're, we're continuing our progress in the meantime. So some of those key areas for development, um, uh, grid infrastructure, port development and whether or not the ports identified are going to have the capacity to support the deployment goals that are there. Those are some elements that are going to need to be worked out. Um, but again, just across the board, uh, unanimous acceptance that we're going to find a way to make it work, which was great to hear. Fantastic. Thanks, Dawn. We're, we're pretty close to time, so I think I'll have to wrap up the questions there. Apologies to those of you who have submitted questions that we haven't been able to get to. Um, we will have our contact details in the follow-up email, so please reach out to David, Dawn or myself. Um, I'd like to thank David and Dawn for so generously sharing their knowledge and time with us today. I certainly learned, learned a lot from the session and I hope that uh, all on the call have, have enjoyed the session and gained some valuable insights. I'd like to thank you all for joining. Um, and taking the time out of your day to attend this session. You know, your interest and, and involvement in the continuing development of our offshore wind industry is incredibly important. Um, please look out for future ACOM webinars and the ongoing energy transition series. We'd love to receive your feedback or any suggestions you may have for future topics that you'd be interested to hear more about. As mentioned, there will be a follow-up email uh, containing contact details for David, Dawn and myself. Um, also the link to the recording. Um, please feel free to reach out to any one of us uh, if you have any questions or you'd simply like to continue the offshore wind discussion. Thanks all and have, have a great day.